today. It hurt to move. It hurt to turn. I couldn't bend over. Six months of brutal back pain. Everything that I loved to do was taken away from me. Supernaturally healed in an instant. I want people to know God can do it for them. Plus, he dreamed the impossible dream. She was like, you're crazy. Like, how do you think you're going to go and do Kilimanjaro? And made it to the mountaintop. It's the biggest blessing I've ever received being born the way that I was. Hello and welcome to the 700 Club. Well, it looks like the investigation into Russia's interference in last year's election is far from over now that the special counsel has impaneled a grand jury. But President Trump has also gotten some good news. A governor has switched from Democrat to Republican. And Gary Lane has that story. Within hours of the news that a federal grand jury is now investigating Russian actions in the election, President Trump came out swinging at a West Virginia rally. He lambasted the special counsel for hiring some lawyers who supported Hillary Clinton and the Democrats for ties to special interests. And once again, he blamed them for advancing a false narrative about his ties to Russia. The reason why Democrats only talk about the totally made up Russia story is because they have no message, no agenda and no vision. The president listed his accomplishments in just a short seven months in office. Accomplishments he suggests his opponents don't want you to know, like a record high stock market, reforms at the Veterans Administration, thousands of manufacturing jobs coming back to America, and executive orders allowing the Keystone and Dakota access pipelines. The Russia story is a total fabrication. It's just an excuse for the greatest loss in the history of American politics. That's all it is. Grand juries are commonly used to subpoena records and witnesses, but they don't necessarily mean any criminal charges will be sought. But the grand jury news, first reported by the Wall Street Journal, suggests Mueller may be expanding his investigation into following the money, possible Trump campaign and business transactions with Russians. Not only can a federal grand jury force a president to testify, as in the case of Bill Clinton, it can also subpoena documents like tax returns and bank records. If I were in the White House, uh, I would be concerned that the investigation has gone up another notch or appears to have gone up another notch. In short order, probably people who are in the administration or former members of the administration or former members of the campaign will be getting subpoenas to testify and to provide documents. But presidential lawyer Jay Sekulow said the president isn't a target of the probe. We have no reason to believe that the president's under investigation here. Despite the federal grand jury investigation, the president and Republicans received some good news Thursday. West Virginia Governor Jim Justice announced he's switching parties from Democrat to Republican. Like it or not like it, but the Democrats walked away from me. Today, I will tell you with lots of prayers, and lots of thinking. Today, I'll tell you as West Virginians, I can't help you anymore being a Democrat governor. Justice is a coal magnate. He owns five mines and more than 100 companies. As he told CBN's Wendy Griffith, he also is a faithful Christian. I pray many times a day and, uh, and read the Bible every single night before I go to bed and uh, I've done it forevermore. When God is in your life, you know, it just empowers you and you, you're not afraid and you just, uh, you just, you feel, you feel him there. And with justice switching parties, there are now 34 Republican governors and only 15 Democratic governors. And the Republicans now control the governorship and legislatures in 26 states. Democrats only have full control in six states. The others are divided. But the news of West Virginia's governor switching parties was overshadowed by all the Washington frenzy over the impaneling of a federal grand jury. The president would like a quick conclusion to the Russia investigation, but Mueller's latest move suggests it may continue for a very long time. Gary Lane, CBN News. 
parties have changed focus and direction. Isn't it refreshing when you see somebody who recognizes that and then makes a personal decision to do what he believes is genuinely right? Well, in other news, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has voted to pass a bill that would cut U.S. funds to the Palestinian Authority because of its payments to terrorists and their families. Wendy Griffith has that story. Thanks, Terry. That's right. The bill is called the Taylor Force Act. It was written after the brutal murder of a bear American business school student and combat veteran Taylor Force. He was stabbed to death in March of last year during a school trip to Israel. The Palestinian Authority praised the man who killed him as a heroic martyr. Senator Lindsey Graham wrote the bill. The Palestinian Authority pays families of uh, like this a lump sum of money and lifetime payments. So if you're a young Palestinian, the best thing maybe you can do for your family in terms of income streams is to be a terrorist. That's sick. We give over $300 million a year of aid to the Palestinian Authority. This bill, crafted by Senator Corker and myself and others, is going to cut off all U.S. funding to the Palestinian Authority until they change their laws which reward terrorism. Senator Graham is confident the bill will become law. Well, the U.S. Inspector General has launched a criminal investigation into wasteful spending of millions of your taxpayer dollars in Afghanistan. That waste reportedly includes buying expensive military uniforms that are supposed to be used in forests. As you know, Afghanistan is mostly desert. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Rosales has been following the investigation and brings us the story from Capitol Hill. People are not being held accountable for wasting money. John Sopko, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, told a House Armed Services Committee he's opened a criminal investigation after the Pentagon was found to have spent more than $93 million on Afghan uniforms. Sopko says the forest camouflage pattern was picked despite the country having very little forest, instead of using the Defense Department's own patterns for free. The only options we gave the Minister of Defense was the proprietary patterns. We never showed him this. The, the, the bigger problem is no one ever did an assessment as to what kind of camouflage is best in Afghanistan. Sopko says it's still too early to determine, in his words, if stupidity, corruption, or a broken system led to the U.S. purchasing about 1.3 million uniforms in the woodland camouflage pattern owned by a Canadian company, Hyperstealth. He did warn if the program is not adjusted quickly, it could cost American taxpayers another $72 million in unnecessary spending during the next decade. Even Defense Secretary Jim Mattis weighed in recently, condemning the alleged waste as cavalier spending in a memo he sent to top Pentagon officials. Defense Department officials also testified on the Hill that they told lawmakers that they're now going to use the Inspector General's report as a catalyst to end the aggressive spending and waste. But right now, the only thing that they've done is start a study of their own. So it's safe to say no changes have been made today. Um, that the report has been out for about a month. Um, the, the primary suggestion in the report was that we determine whether or not there's a uh, uniform pattern is more suitable. Sopko says the bigger problem is fixing the way the U.S. government works and spends money. It's broken. Uh, I, I hate to say it, the system is broken on accountability because we're not holding people accountable because by the time we get out there, the money has been spent and the person who was involved is either retired or long gone because there's a two-year or shorter appropriation cycle and everyone's got the incentive to spend money. Sopko says military contractors told him they get rewarded at the end of the year on how much money they spend and not whether the contract is good for the country. Sopko then scolded lawmakers for allowing this to happen. We have to change that system. And I would highly recommend take a look at the HR system in the Defense Department, take a look at the procurement system, take a look at the incentives that you are allowing to occur which create this problem. Sopko says he's also recommending a review of all organizational clothing and individual equipment contracts in Afghanistan. We'll keep you posted. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Eric. Well, if you'd like to weigh less, you could try sleeping more. 
Not getting enough sleep is tied to being overweight. That's the finding from a study from the United Kingdom. People who only get about six hours of sleep a night have bigger waistline, waistlines than those who sleep nine hours a night. The study found that getting an extra hour of sleep could cut about a third of an inch off your waist. Well, Terry, I'm only getting about six hours a night lately, so uh, I'm going to try that. Sleep. I'm heading home myself with my melatonin. <laughs> That's an amazing stat. Thanks, Wendy. Well, up next, Syria is flooded with Iranian troops. And it's basically a bottomless well of personnel that Iran can bring over and use as cannon fodder for its hegemonic aims in the Middle East. Here are the implications for Israel and the world when we come back. After a nine-month battle, Iraq recaptured the city of Mosul from ISIS. Now, the U.S.-led coalition remains focused on taking the fight to ISIS in Raqqa, Syria, the terror group's self-proclaimed capital. But as Chris Mitchell reports from the Golan Heights, some experts are warning that the fight against the Islamic State might just be a prelude to a much more dangerous battle. Most believe the victory in Mosul and the current offensive against ISIS in Raqqa signals the end of the Islamic State Caliphate. But what happens next is the major question facing the Middle East. You have so many different actors, both at the state and sub-state level, that are working in these very amorphous coalitions and then, uh, you know, against one another, with one another, that this is a very, very dangerous place. I mean, this becomes a tinderbox. Carolyn Glick says a wide range of actors, including Syria, Russia, the U.S., Turkey, the Kurds, Sunni Islamist groups, Hezbollah and Iran all make up that volatile mix. You got a lot of people with weapons. You got a lot of fighting going on in a small territorial unit and its implications both for great power uh, relations and of course for cause the ability to cause massive instability in neighboring countries like Jordan, like you mentioned Israel, and of course Iraq is sort of part of the same theater, are, are just almost mind boggling. From this vantage point on the Golan Heights, you can see that instability in action. A number of groups control Syria along Israel's border, including rebel forces and even ISIS. But the groups that concern Israel the most are the ones connected to Iran. Not so far from here, we have thousands of Shiites, Iranian-backed militias that are fighting in Syria. Avi Melamed says the West needs to know the war in Syria stretches beyond its borders. The war in Syria is way beyond the civil war. Actually, what we see right now in Syria is a huge stage of a huge regional power struggle, uh, roughly speaking, between two, two major forces. One are the Iranians and their backed militias on the one hand, and the other are the Arab Sunnis. Glick warns Syria is flooded with Iranian troops. The Syrian military today is Iranian. Hezbollah is Iranian, of course. Iran is Iranian. And they have, they have an unlimited number of troops that they can bring in at will. And they are bringing into Syria from Afghanistan, from Pakistan. And it's basically a bottomless well of personnel that Iran can bring over and use as cannon fodder for its hegemonic aims in the Middle East. Melamed warns Iran is trying to create a land bridge to Lebanon on the Mediterranean that would pose a great danger to Israel. We have to remember that the Iranian regime vows the elimination of the state of Israel. Trying to launch a military front against Israel in the Golan Heights will uh, could result in a massive eruption because Israel would not stand for that, and rightly so. He says in order to better understand today's Middle East, you must go back in history to President Obama. Obama's administration is definitely responsible for what I call a growing whirlpool of violence. The major reason for that is that Obama's administration, for whatever the reasons are, lined up with the Iranians, enabling the Iranians to expand their influence violently and proactively in different arenas in the region. Now Iran's proxy Hezbollah poses an unprecedented threat to Israel. 
they're in control of Lebanon and openly threatening war with Israel. And not only are their are their armaments sophisticated uh, to a degree that we've never seen before in the hands of terrorists that are controlled by a terror regime, but their men, their men under arms, their soldiers are battle hardened, gruesome, brutal warriors who have been in the battlefield in Syria for the past six years. Melamed believes the danger is greater now than when all of the Middle East ganged up on Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War. It's much greater. Look, we are looking today at reality where you have dozens of thousands of Shiite militants that are already operating in Syria, massively uh, armed, financed, and guided by the Iranians. The Iranians are the same way they took over Lebanon in a remote control using the Hezbollah, the Iranians are envisioning a similar future to Syria. That could lead to a confrontation with global implications. And in Israeli signals, and the Israeli signals are going to be very powerful because Israel is determined not to allow the Iranians to make the Golan Heights a stage of the war. The ramifications of the potential development that I was now portraying of that uh, reality on the ground, the ramifications are not only local, they are not only regional, they are exceeding the regional level, they could be global. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Golan Heights, Israel. Thank you, Chris. You know, there are so many factions vying for power, for land, for control, and we stand strongly in support of Israel, always have and always will. And Gordon has said many times on this program, you know, if you don't understand the history of what's happened there and biblically the prophecy that of what is to come, then it's difficult to pray the way that we should for Israel. Well, we've tried to make that easy for you. I have something I'd like to tell you about. You've heard us talk about it before. It's called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. We want you to get a hold of this, not just because it's an excellent film, but also because it will tell you the story of the history of Israel and why we believe that we are to stand with Israel and that it is God's ordained land for the Israeli people. We want you to have this for a gift of $15. It's yours. There's the information on your screen. Get a hold of it. You can go to CBN.com to receive your copy, or you can call our toll-free number, which is one 800 700 7,000. It's beautifully done, and I think you'll really find it both fascinating and helpful as you pray for the nation of Israel and for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, coming up, a woman who suffered with chronic pain. It grated on me, and it grated on me. This went on week after week, and it turned into month after month. Then I had to give up the love of my life, which was playing the piano. See how she returned to the love of her life, pain-free. Carol Sienza's first love is playing the piano. So when acute back pain made that impossible for her, Carol says it felt as if a piece had been torn out of her. Well, today, Carol is back to doing what she loves most, thanks to a miracle. In 2016, Carol Shenza developed bronchitis with a persistent, severe cough. And I coughed and I coughed. It just hurt to cough. At one point, I coughed so hard that I knew something happened in my back, and it hurt to move. It hurt to turn. I couldn't bend over. I couldn't do the things that I, that I was doing before. While the cough eventually subsided, the back pain got worse. As long as I didn't move around, that was the only time I was ever out of pain. It grated on me, and it grated on me. This went on week after week, and it turned into month after month. Then I had to give up the love of my life, which was playing the piano. When you can't do something you love like that, it's like a piece is torn out of you. And that's the way I felt, like something was missing. So I would just sit in my chair and I was very depressed because it was like everything that I loved to do was taken away from me. Then Carol lost two of her siblings within two days of each other. It was just a grief, horrific grief. I didn't know what to do. You know, I was just crying out to God and I was so hurt. The only thing Carol and her husband Bill could do was pray. I was in emotional pain and physical pain. And, and that I prayed and I said, Lord, how much more can I take? I don't think I can keep going like this. The back pain continued for six months. 
Then one day, Carol was watching her favorite show, The 700 Club. Gordon and Terry were giving words of knowledge. He started calling out healings. And then he starts saying something about pain in somebody's back. And it got my attention. And he went on and he described me. You've had this, uh, like a spike of pain right in the middle of your shoulder blades. God's just released that from you. All that tension is just dropping off of you. Right? I knew when he described the pain in the back, I said, that's for me. And I got so excited. And then Gordon said what he always says. He says, do something you couldn't do before. So I very gingerly got out of my lounge chair and I walked halfway to the television and I bent over and I bent over and there was no pain. The first thing Carol did was what she had missed most. I went in there and I sat at the piano and I began to play It Is Well With My Soul. And I just began to worship God. I thanked him for my healing. And you know what? Not only did he heal my pain and take that away from me, but he healed my broken heart that day. He took that horrible grief and I, I've never been the same. The word of knowledge gave me a much deeper sense of God's love. It changed everything, it was awesome. He didn't care if I wasn't worthy. It didn't matter to God because He loved me that much. I want people to know God can do it for them. If He could do it for me, He can do it for you. She's right. I love Carol's story. I love it because it's such a reflection of who God is as our Father. You know, He sees you at your point of need. He knows your name. He hears you crying in the night. He understands the desperation that many of you are facing for whatever the reason might be. But God hears and sees you. Now today, believe Him for your miracle. We're going to pray in just a moment, but I, I want to encourage your faith also with this story of Christopher. Christopher lives in Selden, New York. He had dealt with diabetes for almost 10 years. His mother called the 700 Club many times for prayer, for healing for him. She never lost faith that God would heal Christopher. Then last April, he went in for a regular checkup when he received incredible news. His diabetes was completely gone. The doctor immediately told him to stop taking any diabetic medication. Christopher and his mother are praising the Lord together for his healing. Let's pray together right now. You know, when we join our spirits as one, when we join our hearts as one and we petition our Father, He is reaching back to you. And you don't have to hear your name called or your specific need mentioned. Just receive the healing. Christopher's came when God was in a place where it was time for Him to deliver it. Now, today is your day. Would you just put your hand on whatever your point of need is, if you have a physical problem, if you have a relational problem, put your hand over your heart. If you're praying for finances, whatever it is that you need God to do for you. Right now, let's reach out together to God, your Father, who loves you and sees your need. God, we come to you today as your children. We come to you with trust in our hearts. We come to you believing that you are good, that what you do is good, what you've planned for us is good. We believe you. We believe your word, God. Today we come releasing our need into your hands. Holy Spirit, would you just come and speak into the lives of people who are praying right now. Speak into their spirits, speak into their hearts. I pray that you would touch every need. There's someone praying right now. There are actually many of you praying right now. You have financial needs. You don't even know how you're gonna get out of the situation you're in. God is going to open doors that you could not have opened for yourself Trust Him and believe for Him and stop trying to make it happen. He's got this, just receive it. Someone else, you have some kind of a condition. I don't know what it is, if it's um, a temporary, but you have these spots on the back of your throat. It is so painful, almost like little lesions. Difficult to eat, difficult to swallow. You've taken medication and it hasn't gone away. You're so frustrated. Today is the day of your healing. Just lift up your hands and receive that from the Lord. Someone else, serious bruising. You have some kind of a blood issue and you can just touch yourself lightly on the corner of a cabinet or bumping into something and you bruise so badly. God is not just stopping the bruising scenario, but that whole situation with your blood is being changed as well. Just lift up your hands and receive it. 
God, we don't want to take for granted or to take lightly the miraculous in our lives. Would you come, Holy Spirit, and fill us with a sense of wonder for who you are, for what you're doing in our lives, and just for your majesty, Lord, we worship you today, and we just say thank you to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a need that you'd like to pray with someone about today, our number is toll free. We're always available to you. It's there on your screen. So easy to remember. 1-800-700-7000. Just call and ask the person on the other end to pray with you. It will make their day. Well, still ahead, a man born without arms or legs sets out on a mission. And that night, I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. She was like, you're crazy. How do you think you're going to go and do Kilimanjaro? Watch this determined young man defeat the impossible. That is on today's 700 Club. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Bribery, fraud, breach of trust. Those are suspicions against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports Israel police confirm the allegations. The police have reached an agreement with one of Netanyahu's former aides to become a witness against him. But representatives from Netanyahu say those claims are false. Quote, we completely reject the unfounded claims made against the prime minister. The campaign to change the government is underway, but it is destined to fail for a simple reason. There won't be anything because there was nothing. Well, a Christian refugee who escaped ISIS gets a new start thanks to Operation Blessing. Walid was a successful tailor back in Iraq, but he had to flee his country when the terror group took over. Many refugees like Walid come to Jordan where they can find a safe haven. But finding work is hard and they struggle to get by. So Operation Blessing stepped in to give Walid two brand new sewing machines and other supplies to start a home-based business. He now makes clothing, custom clothing, and furnishings to earn an income. OB also gave Wallet's son tools to start his own small barber shop. Way to go, OB. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, you're about to meet a man who lives by the motto, no excuses, even though he could make plenty of them. His name is Kyle Maynard, and he was born with no arms and no legs. Still, Kyle has never been one to back down from a challenge, and that attitude propelled him all the way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Wes Rickards brings us his incredible story. Kyle Maynard is tough real tough. He's a champion wrestler. He studied Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He can bench 420 pounds. And every day, he conquers the impossible. Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Kyle began leaving a new trail the moment he entered the world. He was born without arms or legs the result of a rare condition known as congenital amputation. Yeah, my, my parents, they had just normal, normal pregnancy. They went and saw the ultrasounds and the doctor saw that there was really nothing out of the ordinary. So they really had no idea that anything was gonna happen, you know, yeah, that it'd be born different until I was. Normally, congenital amputation only affects a finger or a toe. In this case, Kyle was left with no limbs his parents were left with questions on how to raise their child. What really blows me away is the decisions that my mom and dad made. They had to make when they were super young. You know, my mom, she was more of like the nurturing type and wanting to help me with stuff and help me figure out how to go and do things and didn't want to see me struggle. My dad realized that by helping me do everything wasn't going to be the best solution to the problem. I'd say like, you know, in learning how to eat, you know, he's got to figure out how to eat on his own or, or starve. As you can imagine, it wasn't easy, but Kyle learned the basics. And soon, he wasn't just able to do the things others could do, he was doing them better. 
My mom tells a story about when I like, got in the closet and ripped all the clothes off the rack. And she was like partially a little ticked off at me, but partially like, wow, this is cool. Like, you, you know, you did that. By the time he reached middle school, Kyle wanted to take it up a notch. One day he told his mom he wanted to go out for the football team. His mom called the coach and the coach said, sure. So I was a nose guard playing in the middle. I thought I was gonna be the quarterback, but that was a whole other story. I remember the very first football game that I played in, and one of the first plays that they ran was coming right up, right up the middle. You know, and I remember that moment in my, the way I'd tackle people is taking my helmet and smashing it into their legs as hard as I could. In that moment, it was like I, I had found an 11-year-old, you know, version of purpose in life. At the time, Kyle was just a sixth grade kid who had to work twice as hard to get half as far. His parents, who were Christians, had assured him that there was a grand plan for his life. Now, Kyle understood. His goal, see the impossible, beat the impossible. And I definitely, you know, was at a pretty big depth of despair at 10 years old and, you know, and really had a lot of fear over what the future was gonna be. And I was definitely at a point where I'd lost a lot of hope, you know, just didn't see a reason even to go on. And I really think that making my first tackle in football might have been what, you know, nearly saved my life. That moment fueled a competitive nature inside Kyle. So after football, he took up wrestling. And soon he was winning matches. And it wasn't long before the no-legged men winning the butt-kicking contests became a media sensation. He wrote a book called No Excuses. He also became a popular motivational speaker and made dozens of TV appearances. He is one of the most inspiring young men you will ever hear about. He's strong too, I might add. <laughs> Kyle Maynard is tough. He has to be. He has no arms or legs, but he makes up for that with an indomitable spirit, one buoyed by a faith in Christ. Part of, of Christ's message was teaching us so that we could go and do way more than we think that we can. You know, he'd tell a mountain to move from here to here and it'll do it, right? And we can go and think of that like figuratively, like, oh, okay, yeah, it's just a saying, whatever. But like, no, I mean, like, what if that's the literal, what if that's the literal truth and we're just sort of like, well, okay, it's just a saying. We're so quick to go and dismiss the fact that we're able to go and do these amazing things too. And I think that being connected to something bigger than ourselves is the only way to, to reach that place. Now, normally, this is where a story ends. You have your hero, face the great obstacle, overcomes it, and lives happily ever after. But in Kyle's case, this is where his story really begins. My message is a pretty simple one. After high school, Kyle went on the speaking circuit. But before long, Kyle considered doing something he'd never really done before, quit. I put on like 25, 30 pounds in like a three or four month book tour. It was just this period of time where I was just like, blah. People would say to me after a speech that my story was inspiring and all that. I know that their intent was that it would make me feel good, but a lot of times it didn't. You know, a lot of times it just made me feel different. During this time, Kyle came up with a nickname for himself, the depressed motivational speaker. I was alone. You know, I would be traveling. I'd be up in a hotel room by myself. You know, I, did, I was 19 years old, 20 years old. I'm speaking on stage with senators and presidents and, like, you know, for Fortune 500 companies. And it's like, who am I to go and tell you guys how to run your business? Like, it was crazy. And I think a big part of it was I did not feel, like, authentic with the message that I was sharing. I didn't feel like, like I was actually living the message that I was talking about. And then, a turning point a chance meeting at an airport with two soldiers who said they saw Kyle on TV and were inspired by his life. You know, I think that made a huge difference in, in learning to accept that, embrace it, and wanting to be anything that I do put my feet into, be the best in the world that I can be. You know, I'm competitive, and I think that, that was a big game changer for me. In 2011, Kyle met a Gold Star mother. Her son, Corey Johnson, had been killed in Afghanistan earlier that year. She told Kyle that her son had always wanted to travel and see Mount Kilimanjaro. And soon, Kyle had a new challenge. I told my friend that night, I'm gonna climb Mount Kilimanjaro. She was like, you're crazy. Like, how do you think you're gonna go and do Kilimanjaro? And I told her, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. 
Kilimanjaro has been called the House of God. It's so high that climbers will pass through five ecological zones before getting to the summit. Temperatures range from 80 degrees at the base to minus 15 degrees at the top. It's a taxing climb for anyone, but Kyle wouldn't back down. I've got some really amazing people in my life that I've been so fortunate to have that when I say something crazy like that, instead of them telling me, oh, you're crazy, you're not gonna go and do it, most of them are like, wow, that's cool. How can I help? I've got friends that made my gear out of duct tape and duct tape bath towels on the ends of my arms and my feet. I couldn't just go to like the hiking store and like get like a pair of hiking shoes. Like I had to have, we had to come up with a whole new system. Now, there are risks to the climb. The higher you go, the less oxygen there is to breathe. You're doing great. And the colder it gets, the greater the risk for frostbite. Not to mention the dust or the dry rocks. Kyle was going to deal with this for 30 miles, crawling every inch of the way. Most times, I'm literally, my face is in the dirt, six inches off the ground. Nobody really told me that I shouldn't bear crawl on my elbows and knees for 30 miles before I went. My shoulders and back and hip were shot. My arms, like the swelling in my arms was really intense. So it's this total dichotomy going on of some moments of just intense suffering, like, why am I here? Why did I do this? To other moments of like, wow, this is really cool. This is really beautiful. And connecting to that reason of just why I was there in the first place. After a grueling journey, Kyle was near the top. But the important thing wasn't just how close he was to the summit. It was how far he'd already come. I'm sitting on ice, and I'm looking back, and I could see the entire trail that we'd come up. And it was the wildest thing to go and see. The trail just went on and on and on forever, like out of sight. And I was like, holy cow, like, wow, like, we actually went that far. Like, it's amazing. Hemingway once wrote, all he could see as wide as the world was a square top of Kilimanjaro. And then he knew that there was where he was going. Kyle Maynard was there, 19,000 feet in the air, as the first quadruple amputee to summit the mountain. And once again, he beat the impossible. Uh, <laughs> I held it together at the top uh, until I called my mom and she started crying and I just broke. And I started crying after that too. And a couple moments after that, I got to pay tribute to a fallen soldier. You know, in those really tough moments where I was feeling sorry for myself and ready to quit, a lot of it was thinking, man, he's never gonna get this chance to be here and go and climb this mountain. And it, it really kept me going. It just absolutely was, it's the greatest honor of my life. Kyle returned home and earned an ESPY award for his efforts. He also came back with a different perspective. And now, he's not just working to conquer the impossible, he's helping others do the same. And I've learned whatever gifts that we've been giving, like you gotta go and share it. And sometimes that means doing things that are uncomfortable that every fiber in your body doesn't want you to do. Then you gotta do it anyway. When I was younger, I did pray a lot that like, I would just wake up and have arms and legs. Now I think those prayers have been answered in a, in a totally different way, in a way that I couldn't have ever imagined before. It's come in the form of the learning that I've gotten to have, and that can transcend into anything. Now there's nothing in the world that you could offer me to have me live my life again differently. I feel like it's the biggest blessing I've ever received being born the way that I was. Kyle Maynard, remember the name because that won't be the last amazing feat that you see him accomplish. I love his tenacity. I love his stick to I love the wisdom that he's gleaned from all that God has taught him as he's walked with him through life. An amazing story. Well, the woman you're about to meet is also an everyday hero. Just surviving was a challenge for Tulasi as a widow in India. And then when a cyclone destroyed her home, she was faced with the impossible as well. Take a look. After Tulsi's husband died from tuberculosis, she did her best to raise their three children alone. I started selling fish. I would get the fish from the fishermen and sell them in the market. Then Cyclone Faline hit the east coast of India. It was raining heavily and the waters rushed into our home. Then one wall of her home collapsed. We ran outside and climbed on top of her roof. We lost everything, including our food, clothes, 
and all of my equipment that I used to sell fish. Without a home or a way to support her children, Tullesi desperately needed help. Then she heard about a CBN relief camp that was being held in her village. She received food, clothes, and blankets. After meeting the family's immediate needs, we helped Tullesi restart her business. CBN gave me utensils, a basin, basket, and plates. And they gave me a scale and other equipment I needed to sell fish. We also made it possible for Tullesi and her children to have a safe place to stay. You gave me enough money to pay for a whole year's rent. Thank you, CBN. You have given us a new life. You know, when you join the 700 Club, 65 cents a day, $20 a month, you're joining with thousands of people and you're making a difference in the lives every single day of people all around the world. But you have seen on this program many times some of the huge disasters that happen around the world, sometimes here in the United States, like Katrina, when, when that storm hit down in the Gulf, but around the world, all kinds of things from earthquakes to flooding to fire, all kinds of things. If you'd like to designate your gift today specifically to CBN Disaster Relief so that we can be there on the scene, making a difference with the love of Jesus as well as in practical ways like you just saw in this little family's life, all you have to do is dial the number that's on your screen. It's 1-800-700-7000 or you can log on to CBN.com. Sometimes you like to mail your gift in as well, I know. So let me give you the address for disaster relief. It's CBN Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and the zip code is 23463. Help us be there at the point of need for people who are in true suffering and true impossible situations. You and I really can make a difference when we do it together. Well, I'll be right back with more of the 700 Club after this, so stay with us. Mother's Little Helper was a hit song for the Rolling Stones in the 60s. It could also be the anthem for a stay-at-home mom named Jeannie Carricker. After Jeannie was prescribed pain meds for dental work, she discovered the joy of doing the dishes high on drugs. Shortly after, Jeannie was hooked. I thought, oh, this is the answer. This makes me happy. I can be happy 24-7. I thought, oh, I'm a better mother. I'm a better wife. I'm a better friend because I'm joyful. When Jeannie Carewrecker was a young mother of two, she struggled with the daily grind of being a stay-at-home mom and began to slip into depression. She thought she found the answer to a problem when she was prescribed pain medication after she had dental work. You once again enjoy uh, routine life. So you once again enjoy interacting. You know, if you're high, you enjoy doing the dishes. When the prescription ran out, Jeannie found it difficult to function and sought out ways to get more. I would go to the doctor and, and fake, fake symptoms that needed to be treated. Uh, I would meet people and, and buy pills from them. Jeannie's husband became concerned about her ever-growing dependency and convinced her to seek help at a methadone clinic, which treats opiate addiction with a synthetic narcotic similar to morphine. Honestly, I just wanted to be high uh, and pretended to get help and methadone took me to a much larger scale of addiction. I did not know that I was trading something so small for something so large. Jeannie was instantly hooked, but there was another unintended consequence of her methadone use. After a couple of years, my husband began using also. I believe that it was to cope with the lifestyle that I had created for us. Over the next several years, their drug use escalated and they lost custody of their two young daughters. Your children are wondering, you know, why does my mother do this? Does she love me? Uh, and of course, you, you just get high again and you block it out. Jeannie and her husband began dealing drugs to support their habit and were eventually arrested. Jeannie had been raised in the church, but alone in her jail cell. She questioned whether anything she had been taught was real. And it started me down a path of God is not real. He, he can't be real. He's mythical. 
and it also relieved me of consequence. Once released from jail, they continued selling drugs and began to make their own meth. When their home was raided in 2010, Jeannie was charged with possession, but her husband was charged with manufacturing. He faced life in prison without parole. When I got out of jail and he was headed to prison, and I knew that I would not see him, I, I would not spend the rest of my life with him anyway. Uh, that is when I hit my bottom. I would do anything to escape the reality that he would be serving time for not only crimes we both committed, but something that I basically pulled him into anyway. Jeannie cut off contact with her husband and did whatever it took to get her next fix. I had never not accepted his calls. And of course, the reason I did not accept his calls is because the things that I was doing to obtain drugs so that I could stay high. And he knew this. Jeannie's husband finally got her on the phone and begged her to enter the Love Lady Center, a faith-based rehab facility in Birmingham, Alabama. I came in not believing that anything would work. I came in okay with the fact that I was gonna die an addict, that there was no joy beyond substances, nothing that I, there was no joy beyond something I could manufacture for myself. But over time, the message began to sink in. Something started to penetrate. You know, what, what if he is real? You know, what if there is a creator? What if all this crap that you've been thinking for many, many years is wrong? And then one night at the center, after 15 years of addiction, Jeannie cried out to God. I just said, Lord, uh, I, I know that you created me for a purpose. I know uh, that you want me to do something. Um, help me. I, I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to be saved. I want to live for you. Uh, and, and the joy that, that came, and, and of course prayed a lot that night, but the joy that started happening after that, I can't describe. And there is no drug that matches it. Jeannie surrendered her life to Christ. Her husband, still in prison, had also become a Christian, and the founder of the Love Ladies Center intervened on his behalf. Our, our founder, Miss Brenda, spoke with the authorities and asked them if they would please uh, drop the last charge against him, the manufacturing charge against him, and release him into her custody and see what she could do with us together as a couple, if she could help us. The charge was dropped, and together Jeannie and her husband received counseling and prayer and freedom from their addictions. They reconciled with their daughters and became a family again. Today, Jeannie is a director at the Love Lady Center and shares the true source of her joy with others just like her. The needs that he has met in my life that no drug could, could meet or do for me is worthiness, acceptance, love, true love, purpose. I believe that to know why you were born, because we all are born for a reason, results in unexplainable joy. Uh, I believe that that is, is part of my purpose, is to tell other people that, hey, look what he's done in my life. If he does it in one, he will do it in another life. You are born with a purpose and a plan in mind. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and the future. If you're struggling with your life, your purpose, the meaning of it all, maybe circumstances in your life, maybe the joy has just left you, let the fragrance of Jeannie's story just wrap itself around you today because what God did for her, He wants to do for you. He's not just willing to do it, He wants to do it. He longs to have you come to Him, not to pills or drugs or anything else, not to addictions. He wants you to be addicted to Him. He wants you to understand His great love and that there's nothing that you've done or could do that can keep you from that except refusing to come to Him. 
This is a woman who believed that God was a myth, that he wasn't really real. She had come to a place where nothing in life mattered but whatever the next drug opportunity was. And yet, in a moment, in a short period of time, she began to just cry out to God out of her emptiness, out of the fact that nothing she tried had worked. And he was there waiting. God's waiting for you today. Just cry out to him wherever you are. Just say, God, I need you. I, I want to do this your way. I want my life to be changed. I want you to change the way I think. I want you to change my heart. I want to know you. I want to know what Jeannie knows. I want that joy that surpasses anything that the world could offer to me. That's God's plan and purpose for you. Listen, just ask him. He's, he's right there. He's right with you. It's a conversation. It's not a formal prayer. You're not having to meet some kind of list of, of accomplishments or, or sacrifices. God just wants you. So acknowledge that you want him to and let him begin to work in you. If you'd like to pray with someone today, our number is toll free and we're always here for you. It's 1-800-700-7000. So call now. We want to leave you with these words from Romans. It's chapter 10, verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let that be your prayer today. Let that be your action today as you ask God to touch and bless and invade your own life. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next Monday. God bless you.